all started with my neighbor asking me if I had seen my electric bill this month, and because uh, the rates have gone up. Uh, and so I called and I explained to Mark that we are not a hostile crowd, but some people will literally do anything to make people happy. Because yesterday I opened my bill, and in here is a little piece of paper that says, Notice of rate decrease request. So I don't know, yeah, how much pull he has, but it must be a lot. But please, with that said, please welcome Mark Robinson, External Affairs Manager, AEP Sweatshop. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. Uh, Paul, thank you for inviting me. That discount was just for you, though. We didn't send that to any other customers. So. I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> we weren't supposed to tell anybody about that. So, so now we will get into the decrease. I'm glad that came out before the presentation today. Um, but yeah, we, we'll, we'll talk about that. I'm Mark Robinson. I am the new external affairs manager for Swepco. Uh, I live out of, I want to say we bought property in South Gilmer, it's East Mountain. <laughs> uh, we, we bought uh, four and a half acres there. We're currently building, so we're living in the Longview area, but we're moving out to East Mountain here in a little bit. Wife, three kids, five, seven, and ten years old, uh, so that's kind of my team. Moved down here from South Bend, Indiana. Not missing the winters at all. This is a great winter. We had like a little bit of snow, and that was it. Shut down the whole town, so that was good. <laughs> I was raised in Corpus Christi, Texas, so it's it's good to be back in Texas, and uh, so I spent about four years up north. I'm going to run through a bunch of slides, going to give you information on two different topics, wind catcher, which is one of our biggest generation projects that we're looking at right now, and then the tax increase slash decrease. We'll go over why we went into that conversation and kind of what the results are of that. If at any time you have any questions, just raise your hand and ask me. And hopefully I'll leave a little bit of time at the end uh, for some questions as well. So, Can you hear me okay if I step away from me? No? Okay, so just hover here. All right. Very well, good. You can handle take it out of the stand. Take it out of the stand. Oh, yeah. All right. Very good. All right, so I'm going to bypass the safety video. Uh, at work, you know, in our industry, the electric industry, safety is obviously a, a humongous deal to us. Um, our, our guys and girls are out there right now with their hands on voltage that can instantly kill them. So safety is a big deal to us. There's a safety video, I can send it out to the group. But what happens if, you're, if your car hits a pole? All right, what happens if your car hits a pole and there's wires down on your car? What do you do? Stay inside. Stay inside if you can, right? If you can and you're not currently getting shot, just stay inside. Now, if something happens, there's flames, there's smoke, and you have to leave your vehicle, then what do you do? Jump. You jump. Oh, awesome. Very good. So you jump. And we've changed things a little bit because the standards have changed. You jump initially free, right? Because you don't want to grab the door because that's metal and then you don't want to go to ground, right? And so you initially jump and clear the vehicle, land on both feet. And then what, what we used to do is we used to say you jump, right? You jump as much as you can. Now it's a shuffle. All right? Now you shuffle. Why? Because when you jump, what do you have the possibility of doing? Falling, that's exactly right. So if you fall and you make a connection, that step differential, if it's 12,000 volts coming off of that line, will kill you, or at least do very much damage. So that's our safety moment. We start out every meeting with the safety moment. We have 500, or just over a half a million customers at Swepco. 184,000 of those are here in Texas. Uh, some of the plants that you'll be familiar with is Welsh, Wilkes, Knox Lee, Lone Star, Perky, some of those should ring a bell. Uh, Monticello is not one of ours, that is one of the ones that has just announced that uh, they'll be closing down. So, uh, But those are our uh, mix of coal, ignite, and natural gas. Wind catcher is something that we've been in conversation with our communities about for a while. 2,000 megawatts of wind power. Uh, so 2,000 megawatts, if it was coal generation, would be right at 2 million homes to give you some kind of an idea. With wind generation, because it is not constantly going, we cannot draw 100% of that, it's just under a million. Um, SWEPCO will, will own 70% of the investment. Uh, PSO, Public Service Utility of Oklahoma, will own the other 30%. All right, so why are we producing generation that's not in Texas? 
Why are we asking Texas residents to to buy into generation in Tulsa or in West Oklahoma? They got more wind. They do have more wind. All right, their sustained wind is about 14 miles per hour. All right, ours is about seven miles per hour or less. So if you think about it, that is our fuel for this type of generation. Wind is our fuel. So you can double the wind generation by location. It's just really hard to move wind, so you go to where the wind is, right? Um, there is a dedicated. You'll see it's from uh, Cimarron and Texas, Cimarron County and Texas County, and it will be going east to Tulsa to tie into our power grid, uh, Southwest Power Pool. Um, right now, they're currently already constructing the, the wind turbines. Invenergy Inven is uh, doing that. There'll be 800 turbines. These are two and a half megawatts apiece. That's, that's really, really big. The, the average is usually about one megawatt. So these are two and a half the size of, of a regular uh, turbine. Um, we're targeting 2020, <coughs> the fourth quarter of 2020. And uh, as soon as it is completed, the reason why the construction is already underway is for the federal tax credits. You have to have proved continuous construction. All right, so the construction is already underway. There will be that tie line is 360 miles, 765,000 volts uh, from West Oklahoma over to Tulsa. Uh, we're in conversation with Shawnee Nation right now uh, because a lot of that goes through, the tail end of that goes through some uh, Indian nation and they're really digging in so we're probably going to have to go around at the end so some of the joys of doing that one of the things that i've heard that i i've worked at uh AEP now for about 11 years i've never heard us say other than this tax decrease that we're going to decrease somebody's bill i've never i don't hear it around the office it's always like how slow can we keep the increase from happening right how can we like stop the the hammer you know how do we stop the bleeding? So when I heard this, like, whoa, wait, what is that? What are you talking about? Said that in 2020, due to federal tax called production tax credits, that we could actually lower our customers' bills. Now, you know, we're putting this out there, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I hope it happens. It, and even if it just kept it still for 10 years, it'd be great. But their expectations that would immediately lower our overall cost to serve you and uh, provide increased reliability and hopefully lower bills. And I, I keep saying, so are you sure you want me to say that? Like, we're putting it in print, we're gonna do it. So um, the other thing it does is it helps us change our generation mix. You'll see here in a little bit, we've been very coal heavy, we've been very natural gas heavy. And I am not knocking that. I've spent years and years advocating for that, fighting for that. I think that's a good way to generate electricity still. Our customers are asking us to diversify, just like you would your portfolio. All right, they're interested in solar, they're interested in wind, they're interested in natural gas, nuclear. If you just do one, if you just do natural gas right now, if the EPA or some, some, uh, some unit of the government were to come in and mandate a lot of different uh, EPA requirements, then what's going to happen to your fleet if you're all natural gas? So it is important that we diversify our, our generation mix. Uh, $4 billion in savings for Swepco. Uh, the biggest part of that is there's just no fuel cost. Once you get over the initial construction cost, there's no fuel. So you're not paying for natural gas, you're not paying for uranium, you're not paying for uh, coal. And then the production, uh, the federal production tax credit will take a percentage of this that we can run off of again as long as we can prove continuous uh, construction and it's in by the end of 2020. Bill reductions should start in 2021. So in 2021, you can have me back if, if the bills aren't being reduced and you can, you can talk to me about it. So they put, it, they put that out there. One thing I like, you know, I was talking with Greg Hudson about a week and a half ago about some of the plots that you have here in the Gilmer area. He was talking about the airport and extending the runway. He was talking about the plot just east, I guess it's northeast of town talking about okay how do we make this a site certified uh, location one thing that we see in economic development when we're trying to attract companies one of the projects that we had the, they said the largest determining factor whether or not we will locate in your area is our the availability of renewable energy I've looked at a lot of these projects coming through and when they said that the, the largest single determining factor for whether or not we locate in your community is whether or not you have renewable and this was a big load this is 
10, 15 megawatts. It was, it was a big load. It's something that could really affect our local community. And yet they said, if you don't have renewable energy, we're not even looking at, I don't care how close you are to rail. I don't care how close you are to a water source. I don't care how big of a highway or between what two big cities you're in between. They said, we want to know what your, your renewable energy portfolio looks like. Why? Because a lot of these companies have sustainability standards that they want to want to attain. A lot of them are like Bosch out of Europe, uh, looking at things, and they have these standards. So having this in our portfolio could help us land companies inside of our local communities. And GE has said that they're going to be manufacturing a significant number of the blades and the uh, the frames in the Architects area. All right, so we're, uh, we're going through regulatory review. Uh, we've got some very favorable recommendations from ALJs uh, out of Arkansas and Louisiana's pending. We went, I actually got to sit in on testimony down in Austin, Texas. And so far it's favorable uh, with questions about how are we protecting our customers should something not go right. We've got some protections in, in place. Uh, you can go to the website and uh, I'll see if I can share this. If so, then I'll, I'll send it out to somebody. That way you can click on all these links that we don't have time for. All right, why do we increase rates? How am I doing on time? Good. Good, all right. So I came in in uh, late October, early November of 2017, and like, welcome to the team. You're gonna be representing us in, in our communities. And like, that's great, I'm so excited. Like, by the way, we're closing on a rate increase, and one of the first things you get to tell your communities is that their bill's going up. Like, boy, that is, and not how you want to show up to your neighbor's house. Like, you know, I just killed your dog. You know, you, hi, I'm Mark. I just, yeah, I just blew all your leaves over in your yard. Um, so, so my job is to come and explain why we're doing what we're doing. In December of 2016, we filed for a rate increase with the PUCs. Um, why did we have to do it? So we've asked for, um, and I've got a, I thought I had it. We'll just, we'll just start here and we'll go back. Um, mostly for our uh, major environmental controls and uh, the cost of doing businesses and improving reliability. So tree trimming, uh, hardening our system. We have an older system uh, that needs some hardening. Uh, that's both poles and wires and substations. And then um, the, the federally mandated environmental controls that we've, uh, we've been mandated to put in place. So here's some of them. Environmental retrofits. $700 million, we uh, improved Welsh 1 and 2 uh, with environmental compliance. We went ahead and retired Welsh 2 simply because it was an older unit and it was not worth putting the retrofits on. Um, Perky and Hallsville, Flint Creek in uh, Arkansas and Dolly Hills in Louisiana. Um, we had to do that to meet uh, some EPA regulations that we have and honestly it's an important part of our job is that providing the 24-7. So one thing I like to say is the electrons flowing through these lights right now, not even a tenth of a second ago, they're spinning off a generator at one of our plants, right? I don't have a product that I get to store right now. I think battery technology is coming along. Elon Musk is doing some cool things. I honestly think that some kid in a basement is going to have a mind-blowing idea. And someday we'll store my product cost-effectively for our customers. I, I truly believe that, but it's not here yet. So I can't store my product. I, I mean, as soon as it's run off, it's running to your home, it's charging your phone, it's, it's uh, creating cool air through air conditioning. So making sure that I am available 24-7, because it is not acceptable in America for you to turn on a light and no light to come on. It's just not acceptable. Our folks have come back from Puerto Rico, they've been over there for the past three or four months, and there it's had to be acceptable for They've had to live, that they had about 80% of the island out for about three months before we came over and started putting them back on there, down to about 3% last I heard last week, and then they had a major roll in blackout again. Um, but here in America, we have to have that product available, right? That's why those plants are always running. That's also why we need to have multiple plants, multiple forms of generation, so that if something has to come offline, something else comes in. Into place. We asked for, here's what the numbers I was at before, we asked for $69 million in increase, the PUCs approved $50 million. Of that, two-thirds of that was federally mandated environmental retrofits. So things that were absolutely outside of our control. 
Um, so when you think about that number, um, that, that's a significant chunk of things that, uh, regardless of how well we run our business, it was outside of our control. So you saw the rate increase that Paul was talking about. It came at a bad time. Not, not that rate increases ever come at a good time, but what happened was we had an extremely cold January, if you remember, which makes your electric bill skyrocket anyways. And then we had the increase which runs about, for a, a residential user, is about 8.9%. For an industrial user, it was up over 10. It could be 15. It could, it could have been 16%. Not only that, but we had the drawback because we started in December of 2016. It allowed us to draw back to May of 2017. So it's like a double rate increase at the beginning, which we had a lot of conversations about. And the PUC said that you're allowed to go back till May of 2017 to recover. That means for the next, or from February, about 10 months, you'll kind of get a double rate increase and then towards the end of the year. And it's not like there's a date, it's a bucket of money that we're allowed to recoup. And once that money is recouped, that portion will fall off. You had a 10% increase and you had a 9% drawback. You'll see that 9% decrease once that bucket of money has, has been paid for. All right, this is the good part. Federal tax uh, bill came through January 1 and said we're going to decrease uh, the federal income tax rate change to change from 35% to 21%. For us, federal taxes are a direct pass-through to our customers. Obviously, we don't make any money on it, but it's a direct pass-through. There were some conversations of when, when it first came out. I was like, okay, what do we do with this money? I mean, it's going to come back through us. And the PUCs, the commission said, you're going to push that right back to the customer. Right? You don't get to hold that for hardening the system or improving reliability or tree trimming. No, that's the customer's money. It goes straight back. We totally agreed. Now we're in the process, and if you're on the city council, you'll see something. We've asked you to approve a resolution to basically pause the rates where they are, give us an extension while we go to the commission to approve a rate decrease, and then hopefully in May we'll be able to, and that will also be retroactive to January, uh, January 1. So, even giving your money back is, is an act of legislation, and, and, uh, but we'll get it all figured out. Um, hopefully April 5th uh, we'll, have the we'll have an approval for reduced rates. All right, that reduction is about 3.5%. That's on, that's on the residential level. It's a little bit lower than that for industrials and commercial. And there's May 14th. Hopefully it'll be effective May 14th. All right. Um, so we talked a little bit about diversity. Um, we, we've got uh, coal, we've got gas, we've got lignite. Um, we've done some things with combined cycle. And uh, we're thinking about, you know, as we look at our fleet, if we get wind catcher approved and that becomes a large generator for us, then we can start looking at some of these older units that are getting a little bit more expensive. And we have to look at, okay, which ones of them make sense in today's economy with a lot of the regulations that we have. Some of the things that are always on our mind because a lot of regulations are based on who's in office is what could be coming as well. So another election comes, different administration, you know, you start getting more regulations, a lot of these units get expensive really quickly. And so we really have to look at what's, what's long-term most effective for our customers. Uh, if you look at, and it's really hard to see that, but uh, on the internal circle, we've got about 44% uh, coal, 45% is uh, natural gas, and 8% is wind, and 3% is the energy efficiency programs that we have. Uh, by 2022, 20, uh, we, we plan on having over a quarter of that wind and then a little bit less on both coal and natural gas is where most of that will come from and uh, maybe looking at retiring some of the older plants. The last thing I'll talk about is our energy efficiency program. The Gilmer ISD took full advantage of this last year. I don't know if you saw it on the paper, um, but uh, they got, I think it was $10,000 and they actually split that with the folks that helped implement the program. So it's $20,000 worth of energy efficiency programs that you implemented in your schools. And uh, they ought to be commended for that because you pay for the energy efficiency metrics. And so if you're not utilizing those, you ought to be. And so the school took, took the step forward, did a lot of work with HVAC and lighting and stuff like that. And uh, we'll be saving quite a bit of money uh, from 
here on out. So, very good. All right. Do you have time for questions? All right. This is my favorite part of the time. All right. It's something you can read screens all day. What do you want to know? What question do you have? Yes, sir. Uh, on your wind generator, uh, I know of another power company in Fort Worth that charges extra for the wind generator. Is SWEPCO going to do this, or is this just going to be part of your available power at the same rate? For us, it's all, all part of the same power. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, when we did solar up in Indiana, there was an option to buy in. Basically, it was to claim that, you know, I ran 50% of my house on solar. Now, the great thing is the electrons, you know, once they get on that electron highway, you don't really know where they come from, right? It always kills me when someone comes up and says, hey, you know, I'm going to, you know, our, our energy is 100% renewable. And like, okay, well, and they get that from buying credits. And I get where they come from from the conversation, but no, your bill shouldn't go up. Um, what is that for? Or TU Electric or something? No, just talk about it. I'm not sure which company it is. Um, again, what they're doing is they're not selling you <coughs> those electrons. They're selling you the ability to kind of pat yourself on the back and say, I paid extra for renewable. Yeah, it's bragging right. It really is. It's bra and and I'm, not, I'm not knocking it because, a lot, like I said, a lot of companies have mandates of, like Walmart. Walmart is come in full support of Windcatcher because part of their mandates from headquarters is that they will have a certain percentage of their stores as renewable. In fact, them and Google and Amazon and several others want to be 100% renewable. And so, yes, they're willing to buy up to, to get that that title, if you will, that recognition. But it is a recognition thing. Yes, sir? Can you explain the program you have uh where there's rebates available for businesses that install LED lighting? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're one of the few industries that will allow, will pay you to use less of our product. Isn't that funny? Right. <laughs> oh man, you, you, you talk to your power plants like, wait, <laughs> my job is to make this, and you're trying to convince people to use less of it. It's, there's a couple of different things uh, that are there. First of all, um, on that, you know, you go to Swepco, go to the energy efficiency page. I was just talking with the guy this morning. Um, in some of the programs, it, we've never seen such a rush as we did this year. It's been just insane. Some of the small business, so you can have residential, commercial, industrial, prescriptive. There's several different programs and we can find out which one that you're in. But some of those buckets are already running out of money. That uh, amount that's in that is set by the commission. All right. I asked him this morning, I was like, can we ask for more? He said, no. Once it's set, it's set for the year. So some of that's available to residents. Absolutely, yeah. No, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have like certain kilowatts that no, you're sir. using. No, sir. If you're changing out your light bulbs, if you're replacing your HVAC, if you're like this, building's obviously freshly been remodeled, it's, but you have to do it before. You have to get signed up in the program. Once you lift a hammer or once you pull out a drywall, you're no longer eligible. We have to come because we have to see what's here first. And then we've got to convince you to use efficient measures. And, and there's a certain vendor list that we use, and that's what Gilmer ISD did. Um, they used one of our vendors, and they just kind of went through and replaced an awful lot of stuff. But yes, we will pay you to use less of our product. It's, it's wisdom in using our product. And uh, there's some regulatory measures as well, where we get to keep some of that on our books for a small amount of time if we incent it. So that's kind of our incentive. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Talk about wind energy. Is solar energy still just not a viable large cell uh, source of energy? Yeah, so we did solar energy up in South in Indiana right before I left. It's about seven acres to a megawatt. Megawatt's about a thousand residential units, right? Um, and, and that's generation wise. So you can only claim about half of that when you actually say your generation, so it's about 500 ohms. It's viable. But it's kind of like wind. You have to get some type of uh, subsidy or federal tax, a uh, production tax credit for it to be truly viable. Um, we saw an awful lot of projects. Here's the, here's the wisdom in doing solar. Uh, we talked about the unintended consequences of well-meaning people. And I'm going to get on my soapbox here for just a second, OK? Um, is that solar is expensive up front, right? So most people that can do that you have a little bit of financial means. And so what they'll do is they'll produce, let's say, a megawatt on their property, on their farm. And then what, but they're not using a megawatt all the time. Sometimes the house will be empty, it's the middle of the day, everybody's at work or school. So where do they put those electrons? 
Yeah, they go back on the grid. So the wisdom is, where, where we need wisdom, is how much do does our company owe them for those electrons they're putting back on the grid? Because we can't take them for free and then sell them to you, right? That's stuff. But if we sell them at whatever we sell to them for, so let's say it's 10 cents per kilowatt hour, and they get 10 cents, well, they're using the system as a battery at the expense of people that don't have the financial means to do solar themselves. All right, so they're putting it back at the same expense, fuel cost, overhead, all the things that they don't really have to, uh, they don't have to bear. And so we feel like a truer, truer cost is about a third, and I'm really kind of speaking out of, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's not cents for cents kilowatt hour, because basically you have a poor man's tax, if you will, subsidizing solar farms. It's, it's a good program. Uh, we're doing quite a bit of solar, because solar and wind complement each other. Um, so it, it is good. We just need to have wisdom in how we tie in to net metering and stuff like that. Yes, I understood that right, and you're saying that solar, or solar, mm -hmm. solar is a thing that somebody else does, and you just tie into it. Like it's not you going out and building solar farms. Both, both. Uh, we we've, we've done both. We have built solar farms, and you know I don't know if those numbers on solar. Um, I guess I could look at that that last one. Um, we're doing a little bit more. Some of the issues are is real estate. It takes about seven to eight acres to get one megawatt. And so that's quite a bit of real estate to get a small amount of generation, whereas on about 40 acres, you know, we've got a thousand, you know, megawatts. So, so I, I think that we just need to be careful about how we do it. Um, but, but it is a good form. I'm telling you, if battery technology comes along, solar is going to become so much bigger a player. So is wind. Any form of renewable is going to be such a, such a much bigger deal if your battery technology ever starts penciling that out. It's just not there right now. So how secure is the grid? You know, the whole, one of the benefits of having an older grid is that it's not too super intelligent, but it's getting much more and more intelligent. Um, our security team, I was able to talk to them about a month ago. I forget the number of hits that we have, but we're, our system, we're in 11 states. Um, we have the largest transmission system of any company in the United States and it is constantly under attack. Um, so we have, like our nuclear plant actually has, what do they call it, air gap in their computer systems where folks can't get in without a physical transfer on a USB, that type of thing. Oh yeah, I could talk to you for days about nuclear security. It's, it's a lot of fun up there. Um, but we're getting more sophisticated. The problem is, is that hackers are too, right? So it's a constant battle of keeping your information safe, our grid safe, and it is, I mean, we've got a crack team that does just a great job, but it, but they always have some pretty interesting stories of how many hits that they have. People just, and it could be just someone trying to get in and see somebody else's bill, or it could be somebody trying to get in to one of our power plants or something like that. Something we, something we fight with all the time. What's future nuclear energy? Whew. You talk about regulations. You know, because you talk about like the mini nuclears or Micronuclear, because all the regulations that apply to a nuclear plant would also, you know, apply to a nuclear fuel cell, if you will. Um, I don't, I don't see that. That would probably be the direction that that technology would go. Um, you, you, the big conversation is: Do you do centralized with a large plant, or you do do you do decentralized, like neighborhood generation, where you've got a solar plant that provides for a neighborhood, and it's kind of a mix, right? Because you can't run a manufacturing facility off of one solar array, right? You have to have a centralized unit that produces. So when it comes to nuclear, that's more of a centralized. You're not seeing, I think that they're completing one, I think in Georgia, you're not seeing anybody starting nuclear builds right now. It's the timeline on it. For, for our plants, it's usually about four or five years to get through the permitting Everything for a nuclear plant, it's much, much longer than that. And so people are just completely stepped away from that conversation. And we're seeing several of the existing nuclear uh, plants that are going out of operations right now. We've got one up in uh, Bridgman, Michigan. That's our that's our only nuclear. But it's it's it just got approved for 20 more years of operation. So we plan on keeping keeping that one for a while. 
Yes, sir. Well, when you said a while ago about the uh, renewable, are you saying that if we can attract an industry here under the SWEPCO grid, that they can claim renewable energy efficiency? Yeah, so, so the slide that shows our the portfolio of generation, it would be 25% uh, of that would be uh, renewable over to 26% by 2022. So they can use that number. Now they can also buy RECs, uh, renewable energy credits, if they want to, to improve that number. But just based on if you're getting your power from us, that's, that's the number that you're going to have. That really meets a lot of people's standards for what they expect. But outside, again, the Walmarts and Googles that want 100%. But yes, it, yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, I, when I saw that it came, it was bold and it was highlighted. Most important determining factor is our availability of renewable energy. So, again, hoping to attract, and that's one of the things that we do because we're regulated, we have a set footprint. And if you're in that footprint, we're going to serve you. If you're outside of that footprint, we're trying to attract you. So there's things that we can do as far as marketing our community. And we're talking with Greg about some of those things. How can we market your patients? How can we market your community? How can we be of an, an assistance so that maybe we can get somebody on the lake that can use the water and, and start bringing some money into the community? Thank you for having me. Good information there, Mark. Thanks for joining us today.